for the gift of your love, for the gift of your Son, for the pouring out of your Holy Spirit, for all the gifts of life, and for the gift of being in fellowship and worship together. We bring now these, your gifts, that we return to you, that you might use for your glory in all the earth. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Lord, open our hearts, minds, and ears, and open us up that we might receive the word, and in receiving it, we might be transformed, and that in our transformation, we might share with the world. Help us to do that today, we ask in your precious name. Amen. Now, as you're able, will you stand for the reading of the gospel? From Mark, the first chapter, in the fourth through the eleventh verses, a story of John the Baptist and of Jesus' baptism. And John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, my, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Remembering that this is the Word of God for the people of God, our response is... And let us affirm our faith in the words that we find in the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. today that we talked about last Wednesday in Bible study, one of the comments and one of the questions that kept stirring a little was that uh, the idea of what a prophet looked like. Was a prophet able to be uh, distinguishable from other people in society? Of course, I, I don't know. We have a son that lives in New Orleans. Our, our daughter lives not too far away. And We've had at least we've had two weddings in New Orleans, and maybe going to have a third. So, uh, we uh, not Lynette and I, by the way. Let's clarify that. Uh, family wedding, and and one of the things you'll see in, in New Orleans is you will see street preachers, and uh, in many occasions they will have a uh, well, I would call it a, a, a sort of a, an attitude or an atmosphere about them. A, a, a general demeanor or appearance thereof, and it, they will say things like, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or they will preach in such a way, and they will talk about the coming judgment, or they will have uh, scripture that might refer to that, and so it's pretty easy to pick them out. Now, if you get outside of that <laughs> environment, cities and other places, prophets are hard to find sometimes. In fact, this, uh, Jesus has once said that a prophet's without honor in his own territory, his own neighborhood, his own uh, city, community, and that's very true. So when I preach this message about baptism, I have to be mindful that it's predicated or sort of set up by the idea that there is this John the Baptist character, who, by the way, is a cousin of Jesus, and there is this John the Baptist who has been preaching, and that he has been preaching this <coughs> idea that you come and you repent of your sins, you confess of them, confess them, and then you get baptized. Now, I will say this, whether you grew up in a church that had a prophet in it, or a strong preacher, or a preacher that wore a belt and a camel hair thing and ate locusts and honey, I don't know. But you grew up, if you grew up in the South, and if you grew up in church, you grew up with this idea of baptism, that baptism was about John. Not necessarily about Jesus. Now we know this is Jesus' baptism and all that. And so much of our thinking, and I said it yesterday in our my little article that went out with the email, that there's this idea that somehow we're focused on what happens in baptism. I, I've shared this story on numerous occasions, but there was a lady in our church and seminary who had been baptized five times. And she was looking for a sixth one, by the way. She was baptized five times. Now, I don't know the history of all her baptisms. I know that she came to us at a time when there was a lot of bad things happening in her life and that she had made a recommitment of her life to church and to, to the, the, the faith. And I know that that was important to her and we honored that in the church. And she would sometimes get up and share that at various occasions. She shared it with me at several occasions. So... I'm thinking that maybe 
uh, I would talk, kind of talk her down from that. Being a, a, a seminary trained, in seminary trained at Emory at Candler and, and understanding the significance of baptism, that, we, that it's not about our experience, it's not about how many times we think we need it, it's about what God does, and it's about God's grace. But maybe you grew up with this understanding. She wanted her baptism to mean something to her. She wanted her baptism to signify that there was a new life. And so I sat down with her briefly one day and, and, and sat on the front pew of the church and we talked after service and, and, and finally she decided she needed to go somewhere else where they would baptize her. Now the last time I heard from her or of her, she was on her ninth or 10th baptism, by the way. That's a lot. But part of it comes out of our cultural understanding of baptism, not our scriptural understanding, not even our understanding of God, but it's sort of like people when they tell you, I've been baptized. One of, one of my uh, thoughts there, and I want to share three very quick points because I want us to take some time to, in the communion service to think about our baptism. But there are three things that I can say about baptism that come straight from this scripture this morning and other of the gospel scriptures about baptism. First is that baptism is not so much about our understanding of God as it is about his understanding of us. Now let me say that again. Baptism is not so much about our understanding of God, what we profess. By the way, if you grew up a Methodist or Presbyterian, you went through something called confirmation class. Or, or, or new member training class. Maybe if Catholic you went through that. And after you had been baptized as an infant as a 9, 10, 11, or 12 year old, you went through confirmation and then you made a profession of faith. In other words, and so there is some idea that you need to know something about your faith before you confess it, but not so much so that it's about our understanding of God because can I tell you something? Much of what God does in my life and in your life and in the life of the world is a mystery sometimes. Would you say that's true? That we can understand what God is trying to say or trying to do in the world at any given moment. In fact, we can always say, well, it must, God must have an answer to that or God will tell us about it sooner or later, usually later, or maybe we just have to trust God and pray and be faithful. We kind of live in a world like that right now, don't we? A world in which there are a lot of questions about what's going on, what God is doing, or can some people might even say what God is not doing. But baptism is not so much about our understanding of God as it about God's understanding of us, and here's more importantly, and what God communicates about that. Here's what God communicates in Mark chapter 1, verse 11. This is my beloved son with whom I'm pleased. Wow. Now, uh, my sermon title today is a little, a little misleading because it says in the sermon title, I didn't get that message. Um, we live in a world in which a lot of people don't get the message that they're loved. And then if they do get that message, it's not consistent or it's sometimes irrational or sometimes it's a mixed message with love and abuse. Sometimes it's a message that surrounded and says, well, I'm loved, but, but I don't sure, sure hear enough of it or understand it well enough. I was uh, told a lot of times when I was a preacher that you needed to wait until you could understand baptism before you did it. In other words, as an argument against the covenant idea that we have as Presbyterians and Methodists and, and Episcopalians and even Catholics that we're in a covenant relationship in our parents' baptism. We were talking in Bible study the other day. I said, how many of you remembered your baptism? And, and a few did. A few were baptized later on as, as teenagers or as adults, and they remembered it. And I actually remember my infant baptism because I was a sickly child. My grandfather said, looking at me when I was in the crib at six or seven years of age, he said, well, if he lives, he'll be a big boy. That's what he said. My sister came along, and they were going to baptize her. And so in the, 
in, in, a, in a United in a Methodist church in Winston Salem, North Carolina, shortly before my brother was killed, my sister and I were baptized. And I remember, I remember having itchy pants on, you know, there was winter time and it was wool. And I remember thinking that the people all around me were big, and they were. And I remember thinking the preacher was scary because he was wearing a robe, and he was. But a lot of us get the idea that somehow we need to understand our baptism, that something major needs to happen. There needs to be like this woman in Lula, Georgia. There needs to be this sort of experiential sort of a mountaintop moment in which we can say, oh, now I can be baptized. I understand God's forgiveness. I fully understand that God loves me and has forgiven my sin. And I understand all those great truths and doctrines of the church. But see, I think it's sort of this way. One of my favorite movies, and it still is after all these years. It, by the way, this will make us feel old in that. Tender Mercies uh, turned 40 this year, the movie. Some of you remember that movie. Robert Duvall plays a country singer named Max Sledge, and he's he's on the out and downs, and he finds himself at the beginning of the movie laying face down, drunk in the floor of a little, uh, I call it a hotel, a little individual little ca ca cabins out somewhere in East Texas, and the lady that owns it's widowed. Her husband's been killed in Vietnam, and he has nowhere to go and no money to pay her, and so he offers to sweep floors and clean up the yard and pick up trash and make up beds and so she hires him and the story of the movie is the building of that relationship and it becomes one that becomes romantic and then she he develops a relationship with Sonny who is her 10 year old little boy and he's uh, he's precocious as he can be and so later on and those of you who grew up Methodist will appreciate it they get baptized in the Baptist church but Nancy they were using the Cokesbury handle I just couldn't figure that out in the movie and they got, they're in the truck, and they're, they're going to the baptism, and you see the service, and Sonny is dunked under the water, and then Mac is dunked under the water, and they're riding in the pickup, all three in the front seat of the pickup. And Sonny turns to Mac, and he says, Well, Mac, we did it. We done got baptized. Do I look any different? I don't feel any different. You see? All Matt can say is, yeah, we did. Sometimes we need to understand that our baptism is not about our experiential moment, and it's not about, the, it's not about can I say something? That's my second point. That baptism is not so much about the experience in the moment or about the method or about the depth of the water or about the preacher that does it. By the way, I've heard a lot of people, and especially who I grew up with, and they'll say, oh, brother so-and-so baptized me when I was so-and-so, and, -so, and or, or, or he baptized me, and I remember it was at Easter time, or, or I went through confirmation, or I remember it was after the youth revival at our Baptist church, and, and I remember that, and so we remember all the highlights, and we remember the experiences of it, and here's where I get into that, that baptism is not so much about the depth of the water as it about the, the depth of God's love toward us. Let me tell you how deep it is. When God says to his son, you are my son, my beloved, here's how deep the word. That the word says that that, that, that that moment, it says that the heavens are torn. In fact, it says the word torn in the, in the version I used this morning. Do you know there's only two places in the Bible that that word is used? And this is one of those onomatopoeia things where it's only used one time and one other time and so you can look and say when was the other time in the gospels that the word torn is used and somebody will say well I know when it was it was when Jesus died on the cross torn the veil of the temple was torn now let's, this is my interpretation when God called his son at his baptism in the water with John the Baptist in that moment, they didn't have a christening robe for him to wear. They didn't have a, a ceremony after church in which the preacher stood up and took, made 150 pictures, by the way, with the new child or the new convert. And by the way, that's great. You should do that. But the purpose of baptism is not to have a photo op. Seriously. 
the torn. And the word is the word we get, and if you were to translate it into, into non-biblical language of the Greeks of that era, it's the language of tearing someone apart, literally, in torture. Ripped apart. God's love revealed to us so much so that the veil between God and man is just torn open, and God says exactly what he thinks about his son. And in our baptism about us. Torn apart. It's not about mode or method. It's about this God who loves us. And wants us to know it. And can I say this? And however it gets translated wants the world to know. I don't know, uh, back when I was selling Bible dictionaries and home adventure libraries to small, poor coal miners in the southern part of West Virginia. How many of you have ever been to southern West Virginia? Raise your hand. You know what that's like down there? It's a pretty poor place. I was in Beckley, West Virginia for about six weeks, and then I was in Welch, West Virginia for about four weeks, and then I was up around Madison, West Virginia for a couple of weeks. And the reason I moved around is I sold so many books. And my reputation was there's this little guy from Mississippi come around and watch your money. He's going to get it from you and he's going to sell you a Bible dictionary. Y'all can believe that, can't you? There were poor people there. But one Saturday as part of a, a getting away from selling books 12 hours a day and being chased by dogs and being arrested for not having a peddler's license, I, that happened to me, by the way. I know what the inside of the Beckley City Jail looks like in West Virginia. They carried us up to the New River Gorge. It's a little further north of there. It's between there and Charleston. And, and you go up there, and if you've ever been there, and I, by the way, we visited, and then I rode up there going to Pittsburgh one time. We went by there. It's a huge gorge, and one of the places that they developed bungee jumping was there in the New River Gorge. <laughs> They would attach, you don't know what bungee jumping is? Anybody here ever bungee jump? I was going to say we need to have a session meeting and kick them out of the church because they're fools if they do. <laughs> but y'all know what bungee jumping is? You attach a cord to your rib, to your ankle, or, or maybe to your, I don't know how they do it now. And they would jump off this New River Bridge. It was college students from West Virginia University, which I would never hire anybody from that university because they were doing this. <laughs> they would jump off, and, and, and it was eight or 900 feet from the top of the bridge to the rocks on the, uh, the river at the bottom. And, and it's a deep, steep gorge. I canoed on it, and I know it. You look up and you say, how did they do that? And so the idea came to me one day, and I had a good friend named Dan Faber. Dan, now retired Presbyterian preacher, and Dan ended up having a car wreck at the end of that summer. We had to deliver all his books, but that's another story. Dan says, I'd like to do that, looking up. And I said, what do you mean? He said, man, you're part of an exclusive club when you do that. He said, not everybody's going to do that. And he, and he tells the story. He said, can you imagine going to a church just of people who bungee jump? I said, I can't imagine. <laughs> can't imagine. He said, can you imagine coming in on Sunday morning and knowing that everybody else there has had exactly the same experience as you did? Maybe not from the New River Bridge, not maybe from that canyon. Maybe it was just to jump off the top of their house or, or something shorter than that. And I thought, now that makes more sense. Or maybe it was something that you were just kind of tossed out. He said, anybody that's ever leapt out there and leapt out, and he said to use a theological term, leapt out into the arms of God would understand that. Can you imagine a church full of bungee jumps? Stay with me here. Because imagine what it would mean to go through the, that experience with its terrors and its rushes and its ultimate relief and then show up at church on Sunday to be greeted by an entire building full of people who had been through exactly that. Can I tell you something? When you walked in here today, that's exactly what you had. Wait a minute. You walked in and you found your pew. 
there's that older couple that sits toward the front and they're always sharing the handle. There's the super cheery soprano in the choir who's who's always greeting you and welcome, welcome you. Then there then there's the lady that that uh, always brings more than her fair share at the pot love. Then there's the guy who's sitting there, and I know some of you do this, who are circling the typos in the bulletin, Nancy. Y'all are doing it. I know y'all are. Some of you are. And then there's the lady playing the piano who's trying to make up her flower list. I know that when I'm married to her. She's... <laughs> And then there's the guy sitting there and he's thinking, I can't wait for the next potluck. He said, potluck, are we having it this week? <laughs> but guess what? All those creaky, old, young, middle-aged, <clears throat> happy, sad people that you see and you find in church every Sunday have been baptized, I'm guessing, if you hadn't come to me because we need to talk at some point. We're a church full of baptized people. We're bungee jumpers. We all share the same experience. See, this baptism deal is about God communicating how much he loves us. Not how much we understand about him. Not, not how much we measure up morally or, or, or religiously or righteously. It's not about our righteousness. This, it's about his grace. And it's not about the depth of water, but it's about understanding the depth of it's, that it's torn. It's jumping off and receiving. It's God leaping down and opening up heaven so that it pours out into our lives and literally pours out through his Holy Spirit. And here's the third point. Baptism is not about experience, depth, mode, method, when, where, how, so much as it is how you live out your life as someone who's been baptized. Now, here's the sticky part. I, uh, I love Flannery O'Connor. I didn't really read her. How many of you have read, read Flannery O'Connor or read her? She's good. Georgia lady, Catholic lady. Didn't live very long, but wrote some great stories. One of her, my favorites is one called The River. And in it, there's this woman named Mrs. Conant, who's employed to care for the son of some wealthy child, but has, who has very uncaring parents. The boy's mother is sick one day, and Mrs. Conant takes the boy to the Riverside baptismal service of her church. And standing on the riverbank, she hears the preacher warning the crowd that if they come for an easy miracle, if they come to leave their pain in the river, they come for the wrong reasons. There ain't but one river, he declares, and that's the river of life made out of Jesus' blood. It's a river of pain itself to be washed away slow. Suddenly, Mrs. Conan, the boy, says to whisper something to her and she lifts him up in the air and asks the preacher to pray for the boy's mother who's sick. And by then, embarrassed, the, uh, he, she whispers to the preacher that she suspects that the boy's never been baptized. The preacher commands her to hand the boy to him and says, do you want to be baptized? And when the boy says, yeah, the preacher says, you won't be the same again. You'll count. You know, I uh, think that's true. Some of us are slower to recognize that. My friend in Lula, Georgia, the lady who's five, maybe nine or ten baptisms now, maybe she quite doesn't understand that yet. She's thinking about it in terms of, of, of got to be bad. It's got to get it right. I got to do it right here. And, and really what she should have been thinking all along was, how am I going to live after my first baptism? We call it sanctification in the traditions I come out of. Christian growth, discipleship. You see, um, we do count. We count so much that God says, this is my beloved son or my beloved daughter. 
And I don't know what your baptismal experience was or what you were told about it if you were baptized as a child or as an infant, but I can tell you this, that, that I, I generally have been in churches as a preacher, and I say generally, and most of the people that I've been pastoring in churches and most of the people that I grew up with as a student at Bellhaven and most of the people that I grew up with in the churches I grew up with going all the way back to the Wesley Heights Methodist Church in Lexington, North Carolina, all those preachers and all those people and all those Sunday school teachers, they told me that. And the problem was that sometimes I didn't get the message. Well, let me say this to you today. That there's now a torn place between you and God. And can I tell you something? There is nothing between you and God. There is no barrier. There is no need for a, a secondary medium to do that. There's, see, all you really need is to say and to understand and get the message that God delivered that day in the River Jordan to Jesus, his beloved son. You're mine. I love you. I'm pleased with you. We need to baptize more people in this world, don't we? We as a church you realize how many people didn't get that message? Don't get that message? Need to hear that message again? When God tears the heavens apart in Mark, he begins Jesus to tear apart the social fabric that separates the rich from the poor. He begins to break through the hardness of heart of the Pharisees so that they can have compassion. He begins to break through their rituals and their rules that have become rigid or routine. He begins to break apart the chains that have bound some by the power of the devil himself. He begins to tear apart the notion of what it means to be God's beloved child. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I'm well pleased. The centurion at the cross got the message. He said, this is God's son. The disciples slowly and irregularly and up and down ways got the message. You and I have heard it and we get the message. And now the question becomes, why do we share that? How many people do you know need to hear a baptismal affirmation of you're my child, I love you? How many people do we know when they look into our eyes, we see them or we hear them talk about their life and how difficult it is, we can hear in their voice the, the sign, I, I had gotten that church, I hate to say it, it's kind of on us. Because we're the bungee jumpers. We all experience the thrill of being told we love. Let's go to God in prayer. Oh God, on this baptism of the Lord Sunday, in which we think about our own baptism, and the question might come to us, did we get the message? Do we still have it? Do we understand it? Oh Lord, take us now as you did the day of our baptism and hold us as some minister did, or dunk us under your love and grace, or pour your love on us like the Holy Spirit was poured on us through that water from the vessel. And may we know your love. And may we experience it in such a way that we live as though our baptism was just yesterday. And that we live the rest of our days in the knowledge and the peace of that love. 
Lord, if possible, help us and lead us to those who didn't get the message. For we ask it in the name of the one who came and was baptized and called your beloved, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In just a few moments, we're going to come and we're going to receive communion together. And I'd ask you as we prepare to do that, and we'll give instructions for you on how you might do that. But uh, in your pew in front of you is a little sheet that looks like this. And Sarah Randall will call your attention to that. If that's not there, we'll find you one. This will help you follow along with the prayer of great thanksgiving and the invitation to communion. would ask you now to stand, will you, as we join in the prayer and hear the invitation and join in the prayer of great thanksgiving. God is inviting to his table all who love him. Would you stand as you're able? May the, may the Lord be with you. And also with you. Would you lift up your hearts? We do lift them to the Lord. Would you give thanks to the Lord our God? It is right to give our thanks and praise. O oh Lord, it is truly right in our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. O oh God of mercy and might, in your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You have called forth men and women in every age to be your servants and speak your word. When we rebelled against your call and turned away from your ways, in your love you called us back to you. You delivered us from captivity. You sent prophets and preachers to call us to justice and compassion. So therefore we praise you with the choirs of heaven and with all the faithful of every time and whoever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Would you be seated and be in an attitude of prayer? Let us pray. You are holy, O God, of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. Baptized in Jordan's waters, Jesus took his place with sinners, and your voice proclaimed him your beloved. Your spirit anointed him to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to restore sight to the blind, to free the oppressed. He lived among us in power and grace, touching broken lives with your healing peace. And by the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. On the night before Jesus was Crucified, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples and he said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the meal was over, he took the cup. And when he had poured it out, he lifted it up and he said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for the world for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink this, do so in remembrance of me and so remembering now your gracious acts in Jesus Christ we take from your creation this bread and this wine and we joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming and with thanksgiving we offer ourselves to you to be living holy sacrifices dedicated to your service may we remember that Holy God, you loved us so much that great is that mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, 
Christ will come again. Now, gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, and that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. And by your Spirit, may make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. And God's people said, We invite now the choir to come first, and they'll model it for you. On the table are pieces of bread. This is a method we've gone goes all the way back to our time at the barn and during the time of COVID. And on, uh, on there are cups. We invite you to come as the choir will show you. You take a piece of the bread at the table and the cup and receive it, and then placing the empty there and return to your seats. You're invited to this, the Lord's table. Nancy, the body and blood of Christ given for you. And this is his body and his blood given for you. Susan, his body and blood given for you. Ellen, his body and his blood given for you. Sarah, the body and blood of Christ given for you. Bill, this is the body and blood of Christ given for you. Vic, this body and blood given for you. Pat, the body and blood of Christ given for you. John, the body and blood of Christ given for you. Sarah, his body and his blood given for you.
Would you pray with me? <coughs> Lord, we give you thanks and we praise you, O oh God, that you fed us with your mercy and you poured out your spirit in this place. So continue to nourish and fill us each day that we may live as your beloved people in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And God's people said, we ask you to stand now. We'll sing our closing hymn. Our song is called, In My Life, Lord, Be Glorified, number 468. Yeah.